Okay, so my name is Ralf Michel and I'm a student at the Media Conservation Program at the Academy of the Arts in Bern. Currently I'm writing my master thesis, which is also the context in which this research on RF digitization is taking place. So a lot is still in progress and input, criticism, comments of any kind are more than welcome. My work is being done in close collaboration with the ZKM, Center for Arts and Media in Karlsruhe, and the Atelier für Videokonservierung in Bern. A brief overview of what I will be talking about. An alternating friendly and aggressive talk about the method of RF digitization. What this method makes possible, emulating laser discs and laser disc players, as well as decoding the signal into picture, audio and data. To illustrate the method, I will present a case study in which the method of RF digitization is applied. Here you see a photo of the work UP Get with Watchdog by Paul Guerin in the Clock Tower, New York, 1990. With his installation, UP Get with Watchdog, um, Guerin seems to have wanted to put visitors in an uncomfortable situation. The installation setting gives the impression of finding oneself in a big city dead end street, sprayed painted walls, rubbish, halogen security lights, a chain link fence secured with heavy lock and barbed wire. On a wall further back is a video projection showing well dressed wealthy Yuppies at the cocktail party. Uh, at the cocktail party. With this video scene, there is a window which shows outside street scenes of raw police violence, riots, demolished streets, ignored by the affluent party guests on the inside. Directly behind the wire mesh fence, facing visitors and clearly separating them from the party scene, a German shepherd hand crawls on a 32 inch CRT monitor. The closer one approaches the dog, the more aggressive it becomes, enforcing the impression of physical and psychological threat. Here are video stills uh, of two exhibitions in which the visitors try to provoke the dog. How was this video interaction implemented with the available technology in the early 90s? This photo shows a test setup at the ZCAM in February 2023, where only the interactive part of the artwork was installed and tested since these components are the most vulnerable. To make careful preservation decisions, the work needs to be studied with its original setup components. As you can probably imagine, there were some conservation challenges with this work, especially since the ZKM aims to show and preserve works in the original setup for as long as possible. A special focus is on the laser disc player and the laser disc, the issues of which I will come later. The components of this setup include a Panasonic surveillance camera aimed at the area in the front of the installation. A Sony LaserDisc player LDP-1550 running a LaserDisc, which video sound sequences of the dog. It should be noted that this LaserDisc player was the only serial controlled model that included track jump function, allowing 200 tracks to be jumped back and forth without muting the video. A so-called RBTZ control interface, which is an interface built by Paul Guerin's friend and artist David Rockaby himself, and is an interface between LaserDisc computer and surveillance camera. A Macintosh Quadra computer running Mac OS 7.1 and the software Int Act 4, also written by David Rockaby, which controls the installation. The interactive component functions as follow. The camera input is divided into four zones. Depending on which of these zones gets triggered by the presence of the visitors, the reaction of the German Shepherd head changes on the monitor. The closer one gets, the more aggressive the dog becomes. However, if one behaves calmly even in zone 4, the dog calms down as well. So the function of the interaction is relatively simple. However, considered from a media historical point of view, the implementation with laser disks and the custom hardened software make this very interesting and all the more impressive. Numerous sequences of the dog with their image numbers are stored in the software. Depending on the viewer's location, the corresponding image number is played on the laser disc player. This requires so-called CAV, constant angular velocity laser discs, which can store and retrieve around 54,000 individual images. The picture shown a screenshot of such a sequence with the title Park 1, which ranges from frame number 8180 to 8219. It will no longer be possible to play the work with the LaserDisc player in the foreseeable future. This requires on the one hand the digitization of the LaserDisc and on the other hand the replacement of the LaserDisc player. Both components do not stand alone and are integrated into software and hardware. Prior to this investigation, the LaserDisc video playback, the following steps have been taken by Morgan Strico and Mathieu Flamnec, 
in collaboration with Paul Garin. The equipment was cleaned, disk images of the floppy disk were made, and thanks to the great work of Mathieu Flamic, the Macintosh computer's power supply was replaced, capacitors were replaced, a new hard disk was installed, Mac OS 7.1 was freshly installed, and Int Act 4 software was reinstalled from a floppy disk from Paul Garin's archive. As well as all EEPROMs were read and saved by the RBTZ interface. In order to understand how the individual components need to be connected and how the work should behave, a test setup was carried out together with Paul Gehring and a wiring diagram of the installation was created. These steps were fundamental in understanding the work and its behavior. One of the most urgent challenges are the laser disc player that no longer function correctly to, uh, to perform the rapid image change, changing the artwork um, the head has to jump around quickly, heavily stressing the player mechanics. So spare parts have become rare commodities and the knowledge of how to repair such equipment is dwindling as we heard also before. Another problem is the progressive degradation of the laser disc themselves, so-called uh, laser rod or disc rod, which shown up as white spots circled here. This has nothing to do with the actual laser, but is due to the oxidation of the carrier layer of the laser disc. New laser discs are also no longer easy to produce, as this was a highly industrialized process with specialized equipment. This is where the RF digitization method comes in. In our research into preservation of computer-controlled laser disc, we came across the project called Domesday 86, as mentioned by Morgan. This project was faced a similar problem when trying to migrate a 1986 interactive computer setup designed by the BBC and marked towards schools and libraries as an educational tool in the same way as in Garin's installation, a computer-controlled laser disk is used to allow the user to quickly jump between content and navigate interactive maps of the UK and load video, audio, image and text content. In order to be able to read out all this information from the so-called AAV, Advanced Interactive Video Disk, the open source Domsday Duplicator here on the right was developed. The Domsday Duplicator is a USB 3 based DAQ capable of 40 million samples per second acquisition of analog RF data. The hardware is a USB 3 based 10-bit analog to digital converter designed to allow the backup of Domsday AAV laser disks as well as generic laser disk through the direct sampling of the RF data from the optical head laser of a laser disk player. To create this backup, an RF output must be added to the player. Usually the information where the RF points are located can be found in the service manual and is mainly used for service and repair work. The Doomsday duplicator can then be connected to the RF point via 50 ohm BNC cable. If the player also has an RS-232 interface, as is the case with a Pioneer LD4300D used in the experiments, the player can then be connected to a computer and controlled from it, which greatly simplifies digitization. Important to mention here, something that was pointed out to me on Discord, an extremely helpful community and invaluable resource in this project, by the way, is that RF digitization should not be associated with the Domesday duplicator per se, but should be seen as the FMRF archival method. The same is possible with so-called CX cards here on the left or RTL-SDR devices here on the right. I will not go into detail about these two possibilities as I'm only testing the Domesday duplicator. The Doomsday Duplicator comes with a software that allows to control the player via RS-232 and to select different capture formats. For my tests, I choose a 10-bit packed unsigned data, as this can be processed directly in LDD code, which I will talk about in more detail later. The result files uh, with the extension LDS. If the capture format 16-bit signed scale data is selected, files with the extension WAR are obtained. So we got ourselves a Doomsday Duplicator, installed the necessary software and modified a LaserDisc player. The ZKM miraculously found four new old stock Pioneer LD V4300D players, two of which have now been equipped with the additional RF point. Since the signal is not processed through the entire device, the electronics of the player are less important than the mechanics of the player, which are critical for the laser to read the signal as cleanly as possible. A properly calibrated device is therefore crucial for good results. The resulting LDS file now forms the starting point for two further steps. On the one hand, the emulation of the laser disk and the laser disk player, and on the other hand, the decoding process. 
first I will talk about emulation. In a similar way to uh, how we came across the Doomsday project, we came across the LaserDisc emulator called Dexter in the game preservation community. Dexter is a proprietary hardware replacement for LaserDisc player originally developed to make arcade games from the 80s and 90s, such as Dragon Slayer, as we've seen before, playable again. However, the Dexter emulator can only emulate certain LaserDisc player models. One of these models is a Sony LDP1450, whose architecture is similar to that of our LDP1550 in Garin's installation. To load the Dexter emulator, the so-called LDS file is required. This file was sent to the developer of the Dexter emulator, who then loaded the emulator and configured it for us. After receiving the emulator, we connected it to the rest of the installation components and started the installation. The dog appeared and barked as it did on the original LaserDisc. However, we noticed a certain delay in the image during some image changes, particularly between sequences of high aggression and calmness. The emulator offers the possibility to follow the command execution inside the actual LaserDisc player via a diagnostic button. Communication between the computer and the LaserDisc player take place via so-called LDMG1000 commands. All nice numbers. <laughs> Here is the extract from the LDMG1000 comments manual. As mentioned in the beginning, the LDP1550 is the only player that can be controlled via RS-232 and has the multi-track jump, multi jump function, highlighted here as corresponding to the 2E and 2E commands, which is not implemented in the LDP1450 and therefore was not implemented in the Dexter emulator. Reading the log file then also revealed that the Dexter emulator did not recognize the two comments 2D and 2E as illustrated here on the left. After inquiring with Matt O, the developer of the Dexter emulator, the two comments were implemented and our Dexter emulator was updated. After implementing these comments, the dog reacted exactly as it did with the original LaserDisc player and the original LaserDisc. Our goal of replacing the LaserDisc player and the LaserDisc without changing any of the other original work components, including the software, was achieved. Using this method, it is now possible to exhibit the work again. Finally, I would like to talk about LD decode. Even <clears throat> if the aim is not to emulate, it can be used to save the contents of the laser disk. The LDS file can be decoded into picture, sound and data. The decoding is done with the open source program of LD Decode and the help of FFmpeg. However, LD Decode also includes a large number of other tools. This includes LD Analyzers, LD Chroma Decoder, LD Export Metadata, LD Disk Stacker, of which I will briefly present a few. In just the first step of the decoding process, LD Decode to get from the LDS file to a TBC file, there are numerous options to choose from, of which I've tried, let alone understand, only a few. However, there are some very well documented how-to guides to get you started. So from here on, I feel a bit on shaky ground as I'm still in the middle of my research, uh, reading through this complex technology. <laughs> The TBC file contains a time-based corrected interlaced signal. The sampling rate is four times the frequency of the subcarrier for FSC. This results in a composite full-frame digital video file <coughs> of the video signal. For NTSC, this means a resolution of 910 to 525, and for PAL, 1135 to 625. The resulting data volume is also shown here, 204 gigabyte per hour for NTSC and 252 gigabyte per hour for PAL. To test the decoding process and make comparisons with the conventional digitization method, I used in this new old stock Pioneer GGV1069 NTSC reference disk and the new old stock Pioneer LDV4300D laser disk player, both from the ZKM. If anyone has a PAL reference disk, I'm looking for one. I haven't even found a photo of the cover. <laughs> Very rare. <laughs> um, once you have decoded the LDS file into the TBC file, this file can then be analyzed in LD Analyze. Here you can see the full frame image. In addition to the active video, the vertical interval blanking, the vertical interval test signal, the vertical synchronization, the color burst and the horizontal synchronization can be seen here. 
In addition to the viewer, where you can also display colors, further analysis tools are available, such as dropout loss analysis, white signal to noise ratio analysis, black signal to noise ratio analysis, a vector scope, a waveform monitor. The next step in the decoding process is the LD chroma decoder. In order to draw conclusions about how the colors is to be decoded, a chroma decoder configurator here available is available here on the right. Here, various settings for color and brightness can be made and different chroma filters can be tested. The result can be displayed in the viewer. These settings, um, the, the settings that can be made are similar to those of a hardware time-based corrector, here simply in the software and after the actual digitization process. The next step, uh, as I mentioned, is with LD Chroma Decoder. Uh, there are also numerous options here. Here is just one example of what the choice of chroma filter means. Left decoded with the NTSC 3D chroma filter, right with uh, NTSC 2D chroma filter. Overall, the image on the left is a little clearer than on the right, but especially when you look at the middle, you can see unsightly moiré effects, which is in the NTSC. See, 2D method correspond more to what we understand by more. Is this visible? Yeah. Other functions include exporting metadata stored on the laser disk via LD export metadata. Here is an example of the digitization of uh, this test laser disk with numerous chapters. This laser disk navigation information can be exported as FF metadata in order to later store the chapter information in the video. And then it's accessible again, these chapter infos. Another interesting function is offered by LD Disk Stacker. If there are several copies of a laser disk, they can be combined after digitization via LD Disk Stacker and played out as one video. Depending on how many laser disks are being processed at the same time, the program acts differently. In the following example, two laser disks were processed together. Disk 1 shows a spot of Discord in the top left corner of the picture. Disk 2 shows one in the top right corner of the same frame. Is this visible? Yeah, great. The picture below shows uh, the result of the disk stacking and you can see both defects but in a weaker form. If I add a third laser disk, which, however, is of significantly poorer quality and heavily affected by disk rod, the dock no longer appears quite as sharp and colorful, but the two missing spots can no longer be seen because there was no defects in this frame and the final combined frame was therefore compensated with these pixels. Now I'm also wondering what the quality comparison looks like with the conventional laser disk digitization method via composite output. And this is not uh, as easy as originally thought. I really realized relatively quickly that Öpfel und Pire miteinander vergleich, that I'm comparing apples with pears, like how we say uh, in Switzerland. There are too many different parameters to make qualitative differences. Even if I used one and the same laser disc player and laser disc, there are many different parameters in the area of video digitization that have not yet been investigated in detail such as the effect of different capture cards, time-based corrector, capture software, and display equipment. Initial preliminary digitization tests have already shown considerable differences among them. Furthermore, with the RF digitization method, I now have options available to me that I don't have in conventional digitization, such as the choice of different COM filters for decoding, or the choice of the first visible line, and many other things, the meaning of which I'm still trying to work out. And I haven't even mentioned the options for audio yet. Also, this whole project is not limited to laser disk, uh, but to practically all frequency modulated signals uh, with a fork of LD decode uh, called VHS decode, which is not limited to VHS only, as can be seen from the GitHub wiki on the project, where tape formats such as Umatic, Betamax, or OpenReal formats to name a few, are also mentioned. So back to UP get with Watchdog. Um, the digitization of the RF signal makes it possible to preserve computer-controlled laser disks, works of art, and cultural assets. Furthermore, regardless of qualitative comparison, it can be said that all the information 
of the analog carrier, be it laser disc or tape-based format, can be preserved, even the information of the analog carrier that we may not know about today, which is not the case with conventional digitization methods. There is still a lot to discover, develop and explore in this area, and I'm happy about any discussion. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for just one question. Okay, I'm going to go in the back. Very simple. Okay. Am I correct that Dexter doesn't mean to solve the problem in the long term? Um, yeah, yeah. What you said is uh, probably right because um, it's uh, Dexter is proprietary, as I said. Um, probably, um, if there are some development of like open source. Um, hardware laser disc emulators then probably yes but the the rest the the, the ldd code the rf digitization via domus this is all uh, these are all open source tools okay unfortunately we have to move on to the next presentation but thank you morgan and ralph that was fascinating thank you